on, uh, on Facebook Live. It's my pleasure to get to introduce uh, Dr. Koo. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Koo is an orthopedic surgeon specializing in uh, operative and non-operative procedures for the sh shoulder specifically. Um, he has built quite the reputation as the, uh, the shoulder guy. Um, in fact, any time a patient asks me who do I see for, for my shoulder or who would you see if it were your shoulder or more importantly, probably who would you send your mother to if it was <laughs> her shoulder? It's always Dr. Koo, without a doubt. So we're uh, thankful to have him practicing in the area and uh, thankful that you're uh, taking some time to hang out with us. So appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good to be here. <laughs> thank you. So kind. <laughs> And so, um, yes, yeah, so I'm Samuel Koo. I, th I think I know a lot of you guys. I just want to get an idea of who's here. So I know there's some therapists here. So raise your hand if you're a therapist. So mostly therapy. Patients. <laughs> and who else? <laughs> a neighbor and a husband who has two shoulder issues. So okay. Taking notes while he's still at work. Okay, got it. And so, you know, I've been here before. I gave other lectures that were maybe a little bit more comprehensive shoulder talks. Today, I'm going to actually limit it to uh, newer techniques in, sh in shoulders. And so uh, it won't be a, a full-on version of kind of what shoulder arthroscopy and surgery and non-surgical techniques are. This will really be about the new stuff over the last year or two. And then if we, uh, when we have time for questions and answers, please feel free to ask me any questions that you guys might have. And certainly happy to kind of go over those things at that time. So click. All right, perfect. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So um, just a little bit about me. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I was trained as a uh, orthopedic surgeon primarily. I did most of my uh, training in the Chicagoland area. I know I have a Cubs fan back there. Anybody else with ties to Chicago? <laughs> where, where are you guys from? How? Well, I spent five years after undergrad in Chicago. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah. So okay. Downtown? Where are you? I uh, worked in Hyde Park. I live oh, in yeah. Logan Square. I live uh, right. East Lakeview. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I ran a business over there, too. So I'm from Detroit originally, but I'm from Midwest. Okay. Side. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, how about the rest of y'all? I worked at Lake Forest Hospital for about three years. Okay. Minnesota out in the Burbs? Yeah. At Chicago Medical School. Okay. Yeah. That's right my tree. Yeah. I was born in Hinsdale. All my family roots are from Chicago. South oh, my gosh. Yeah. Dad went to Loyola. Okay. Great. Uncle went to Northwestern. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I actually went to Wheaton College. So I was in the suburbs, western suburbs for a while and then did most of my training downtown. So I almost spent 15 years there. So I'm very familiar with the area. Um, you know, hung out with the Chicago Bears and Cubs while we were there. So that's what we were talking about before. Um, <clears throat> but I grew up around here, so we're back home. So it's good to be here. I've been here about seven and a half years, almost going on eight now. And, uh, you know, I've chosen to do shoulder. And um, after my residency, I did a shoulder fellowship with Steve Burkhardt. I think a lot of the physical therapists will know him. He's a kind of a, you know, one of those guys that uh, basically started shoulder arthroscopy back in the 90s. Been an awesome mentor and, and friend to me over the years as well. So today, as we talked about, <clears throat> this is what we're going to talk about. We'll talk a little bit about kind of the overall state of shoulder surgery today. Talk a little bit about the new techniques and advances in shoulder surgery and treatment. We'll talk about both non-operative and some uh, operative uh, <coughs> subjects here. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what the benefits of specialist at the risk of completely promoting myself. I think it's a good topic to talk about a little bit. So today, um, <coughs> shoulder today, being in the Seattle area is kind of a uh, interesting area for shoulder practitioners, mainly because uh, sh Seattle shoulder thought has lar largely been influenced by, you know, people at the University of Washington with Rick Matson, who was a very uh, big proponent, and continues to be a big pro proponent of open shoulder surgery, and <clears throat> as um, a lot of you know, as time has gone on, if you can even look at something like the knee, um, you know, a lot of patients would know as well as a lot of therapists would know the kind of the trajectory of where knee has gone is gone from really open techniques right doing open ACL reconstruction open meniscal repairs or meniscectomies to today in 2017 I mean when's the last time you heard of anybody doing an open knee procedure right hardly ever 
short of doing like a, a knee replacement, really all knee, sh knee operations are done through an arthroscope, which is a small instrument that we'll talk about, uh, m like a microscopic instrument that you, you use to do it in a minimally invasive fashion. And I would argue today that uh, shoulder is along the same path, but maybe just a little bit behind the knees, just because it's a little bit more complicated joint. As you can see, I mean, the shoulder goes in so many different ways. The knees really, this is it, you know? So that's why the shoulder's a lot cooler joint to work on. <laughs> I'm sure a little biased. <coughs> um, but I would argue that today in 2017, really the state of the art technology, and, and again, my biased view of this is that if that is the right way to go for just about anything in the shoulder. Today, and as you, you can see uh, in <clears throat> my talk to come, uh, almost everything that you can do, I think you can do it either better or at least as good as open techniques. And so, you know, as the years go by, I think we're going to continue to see the advancement of arthroscopic technique. And eventually, just like the knee, I think you'll hardly uh, see people uh, getting open surgery done. Are you guys Physical therapy-wise, are you guys seeing many open cases even now? Yeah, really not m many. But there are people doing it. I, I mean, I hear about it all the time still. So, <clears throat> so platelet-rich plasma, PRP. Anybody hear of this? It's a lot of therapist patients. Yes. So platelet-rich plasma, it's it's not uh, the newest thing, but it's been pretty new over the last five years or so. In terms of non-operative treatment and injection techniques into people's shoulder problems, you know, a lot of you guys probably heard of cortisone injection, yes? Cortisone, it's an anti-inflammatory that inject into multiple different body parts. <clears throat> but nowadays, I think this is something uh, that's a viable alternative. And if you heard of like people like Kobe Bryant or you know, other uh, high-level uh, <clears throat> sports personalities, they go over to Germany or Europe to get procedures done, they're usually something like this, getting PRP or bone marrow type of uh, <coughs> procedures um, where you actually draw blood from your own body, and this is how you do it, and you spin it down in a centrifuge uh, so they can get a higher concentration of these healing factors. And then by concentrating, then you inject it back into the site of interest, or in this case, the shoulder, and that helps to treat the issue at hand. And compared to something like cortisone, which is kind of an artificial substance, right, that you're putting into the shoulder, really doesn't do anything other than act as an anti-inflammatory. And in fact, if a lot of you have been in surgery with me, people who've had cortisone injections in the past before into the shoulder, you can often see residue cortisone in the shoulder when you go inoperatively, because that's what it uh, leaves. And, and many people are also aware of the downside of cortisone, which can, you know, with multiple injections, it can decrease the quality of your tissues, right? Weaken bone, uh, it can, you know, have some other uh, <clears throat> deleterious effects in, your, in the area that it's injected. Really, PRP has none of that. Uh, it's your own stuff, so it's naturally safe. Um, it really doesn't have a limitation as to how many times you can use it. And so I think this is a very intriguing and an interesting option for patients and you know, for you guys in physical therapy to op maybe suggest to your patients as a positive, positive, uh, possible alternative. And so what it is, it's, uh, it has these reservoirs of healing factors, right? It's concentrated as we talked about and it's an in-office procedure where we can do it all uh, with them <coughs> in the same appointment. And uh, again, contrary to what uh, cortisone does, this will actually help to build up and repair tissue. And the way I like to explain it to patients is it's, you know, just like when you get a bruise, for instance, you hurt yourself, the body automatically brings cells to your body to initiate the healing response. You're just artificially doing it here with the PRP. Anybody know anybody who had a PRP injection? Yeah, probably a lot of therapists nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Do you have good luck with calcineuropathy and PRP injections? Yeah, so the other thing I'll mention about PRP is that because it's fairly new, really it's uh, still considered experimental. And so insurance companies do not cover them. Um, it is out-of-pocket expense for patients who want to do them. And really in terms of delivery or how many times, that's really varies from 
uh, practitioner to practitioner. And even in the uh, types of injuries that it's used for, whether it's tendinopathy, rotator cuff tears, arthritis in the shoulder, any number of those type of things, really there's no long-term or controlled studies looking at them. I can tell you anecdotally of the patients that I've treated, I've had some really good response in many patients, and there are also patients that do not see much improvements. Um, but I think it's, again, it's uh, the only downside I see because it's safe, it's your own blood, it's really the cost. Um, and so if that's something of an option for uh, some patients, I think it's an, uh, something to consider as an alternative treatment. Any other questions about that before we move on? All right, so we'll talk about arthroscopy. So this is kind of the main instrument for orthopedic surgeons to use. Um, you use small incisions, as you can see up there in the shoulder. Um, they're about this big, right, maybe a centimeter or so. You use instruments the size of a pen to get inside, and you have a, a small camera that you insert into the joint, and you actually look up on a monitor to see what you're actually doing. And the cool thing is that it's in HD. Nowadays, everything is in HD. Maybe one day it'll be, four, actually, there is 4K available, too. Um, and it's magnified, too, because the shoulder is a small joint, so when you put something in, the nice thing, when you open it, say you did an open technique, really, you're seeing it in real time, in real size, and only from one aspect of the area that you open, right? If you open in the front, you can see it open in the front. With this, because of the small incisions that you get in there, you can kind of get it multiple perspective uh, from wherever you decide to put it in, and it's magnified four times. And so these are the kind of pictures that you get with an arthroscopy. So you got the H stands for the humeral head, which is the ball of the ball and socket joint, and the G, which is the glenoid, which is the socket. And the, again, just beautiful pictures that help you to look at the shoulder, I think, in a lot more precise way. Um, over the years, the instruments have also gotten really much better um, and, so that uh, you can do really complicated uh, <coughs> reconstructions. The implants that we use tend to get smaller and smaller. We used to use metal screws, and you know there are instances where you might have to do that, but that's hardly ever used now. Nowadays, uh, they're either bio uh, composite material, meaning they're material that actually disappears in your body over time, or they're plastic material. <coughs> so that now you can use all these instruments to form, uh, do c complex reconstructions in the shoulder. And these are some of the things that I'm gonna talk to you about today. I think it really the advances in arthroscopy allows us to do uh, really special things now that we weren't able to do before. Where you take a tear like this, on the uh, lower left, you can see where the rotator cuff tear was. I'll use a, <laughs> <laughs> right there. So that's where the, rot the tendon is supposed to sit. And after you repair it, you can see that you get a watertight closure of that rotator cuff. And really, with the arthroscopic techniques, you can see that well, and, and you can get that type of repair. So um, because of the advances that we've seen, now we're able to do something like this, superior capsule reconstruction. Anybody hear about this? I think, my guess is probably not many. Physical therapist? Nobody? No, you know, I'll briefly touch on that, but it's, yeah, that's called a reverse total shoulder. As a, and yeah, so superior capture reconstruction is um, <coughs> this procedure here. Um, anybody here of any, but, uh, any patients, fa friends or family that's been told you have a rotator cuff tear, but it's too big and there's so much atrophy, you can't fix it, it's irreparable. Anybody had that said to them? So, you know, I have a lot of therapists, I have patients that come to see me all the time that's been told this before, and it's a, it's a big problem because the rotator cuff is a muscle, and when it tears, and if you don't deal with it and you leave it alone for a long time, you get atrophy in that particular muscle to the point where that there's nothing left. And so you, even if you try to repair, you just couldn't do it. And there truly are people with irreparable tears of the rotator cuff. And in the past, that used to be a really, really big problem. And, and even now, it's still a big problem. However, now I think there's a little bit of a solution here that we can offer to those type of patients. Because before, when people came in with that kind of issue, we really didn't have much to offer them, right? Um, recently, because of the reverse total shoulder, which I'm sure many of you have seen or know somebody has had a reverse total shoulder, we're offering reverse total shoulder for people with rotator cuff issues that are big and can't be repaired. 
But the problem with that is now with the reverse twelve shoulder, you're, re you're replacing the entire joint. And they may have actually very, very good cart cartilage, and they may be young. What are you going to do about those type of patients? And so this is for those type of patients. It's a very specific type of patient that would benefit from something like this. They have an irreparable tear. They're younger with good cartilage. And so in the name of um, <clears throat> trying to maintain anatomy, right, and, uh, and not you know, go into more invasive procedures like a uh, shoulder replacement of some sort, really this came up. And it was developed in Japan because in Japan they don't have access to reverse total shoulders. So they had to figure out ways to treat people like that. And this is the technique that they came in. So <clears throat> let me see if I... So this is kind of the thing that you're talking about, a reverse total shoulder. It's a shoulder replacement where you change the position of the ball in the socket so that you can <clears throat> compensate for people without the rotator cuff by relying on the big muscles to do the work for you. But now, um, with the superior capsule reconstruction, you, we use these graphs. So these are cadaver graphs. It's from the back of a cadaver. And they're three millimeters thick. And I'll start this video. Hopefully it'll start. Oh, no. No video? Can we go back? Oh, there you go. Oh, is that video not going to play? Ben? I have another video coming up, too. Would it be better if I just go and uh, put, plug in my computer, too? Yes? Okay, can you just hand me my... Yeah, I know. I can't move. The videos are cool. You guys have to see this. But do I have an HDMI port? <laughs> this does. Okay, here. Um, Is there a port for this? I think I might have one. I do have different converters. No, nope, that's not it. That's not it. Hmm. Oh, that one might. Yeah, that one might work. work. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Should I just take this off? Please work. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. That is amazing. There you go. So this is what it looks like. It's a um, dermal allograft. It really looks just like a piece of dead tissue. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the nice thing about this, before recently, it really didn't have thick enough tissue. They came in pretty much millimeter or two millimeter thick tissue. And nowadays, uh, you have these uh, 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 thick tissue that now you can use to do the superior capsular reconstruction. And the idea here. and maybe I'll go a little bit further, is uh, for people with these type of fatty degeneration or atrophy in the muscle, and you know where you're looking at is really in this area. Can you guys see that button? Um, this is where the supraspinatus or the rotator cuff sits, and the white is the fat, and this, uh, the darker substance is the muscle. You can see basically there's really not much left versus you know, in a more normal person, this is kind of what it looks like. You have much more muscle and less fat. And so in these patients, this is kind of the procedure that you would do. And the idea is because you don't have a superior restraint to motion of the humerus, um, when people with massive cuff tears that are irreparable, what happens when they try to initiate that motion up is that the humerus escapes superiorly. And as a result, they have the pseudoparalysis. They can't get it up there. And so what this procedure allows us to do is that by recreating the superior capsule, you're actually creating a superior restraint 
to motion of that humerus up. As, as you initiate that motion, it prevents that humerus from escaping superiorly, and then it balances the force couples so that you can actually use that shoulder well. And so it's a very nice procedure for these very difficult to treat patients. And so this is just kind of showing that uh, you're putting some anchors on the glenoid side. <clears throat> um, you're also putting some anchors on the humeral side and use this graph that you fashion and you actually measure out uh, in surgery. Um, like so, obviously it doesn't take like two minutes like it's doing here. <laughs> Uh, and then you create that superior restraint. And this is all done arthroscopically nowadays. And so uh, by doing this, you give really patients really with not much hope or patients who may be told that you have to do a reverse total sh shoulder replacement when they're younger and have good cartilage. Now you have an option for them to consider an arthroscopic procedure to help them actually live their lives, which I think is just, it's a fantastic advancement. And this is really one of the uh, new treatments, 2017, it came out probably about a year ago or so, that is being a lot more well accepted. And you'll see a lot more of these patients, I think, going forward if you haven't already. And so I can tell you that there's patients that came into my clinic, they could not raise their arm up. After the surgery, they're able to raise their arm up overhead. It's really quite amazing. And uh, it's not because they're getting new rotator cuff, that's not what we're doing here. It's because you're you know, providing that superior restraint and balancing that force couple. And so, um, yeah, so superior capsule re reconstruction is one technique I think that you guys should all be aware of. And uh, it's an option for people with that, that kind of, uh, those set of uh, needs. Massive tears uh, that's irreparable or people who've had repairs that failed, right? Younger patients with good cartilage. What, what, does that look, what do you think that looks like as you get towards maybe a year out? Is it kind of all scarring over the top of it? or is it? Yeah, you know, these things actually incorporate. So although you're putting in someone else's tissue, eventually your body replaces it with their own. Okay. Yeah. And so this is just purely just the superior restraint. It's not going to recreate the, um, <clears throat> the muscle, so the weakness may still be there. So what you're relying on really is the balance force couples. Any questions so far on that? All right. Do yes. Do they get pretty good return to activity in comparison to doing a rotator cuff repair as far as function, you know, like throwing or any type of thing? Would there be limitations? Or yeah, you know, it's no, nothing is ever as good as repairing native rotator cuff. So if you have a rotator cuff you can fix, it's always better to do that. Now this, these patients aren't those type of people. And so I think you're always going to be weaker. You're going to have more functional limitations. But compared to what you know, they had as options before, it's a huge and significant improvement in my eyes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So the next one is for another set of hard to treat individuals. Um, I think a lot of you guys probably seen younger patients with arthritis. Um, and you know, I'm talking about people in their 30s people in their 40s and they have arthritis. I see a lot of firefighters that come in with these kind of pr problems, right? Because they're doing so many you know, hard things every day in their lives, really wear out their shoulders early. What do you do? Are you gonna do a shoulder replacement in a 30-year-old patient? It's kind of a tough thing to sell, you know, because at, at, at its best, it probably lasts about 15 to 20 years and then you need a revision. And as may, many of you may or may not know, when you have to revise a shoulder replacement, that's a really tough thing to do because there's really limited bone stock. And so again, before, not much option for these type of patients, right? You do a lot of injections, like cortisone injections. You might do PRP nowadays even too, and I've, do, I've done that in a lot of these patients. But once those things don't help and they don't work, what, what other things can you offer them? Um, and in the past, there really wasn't much. Basically, you might go in and clean up stuff, right? Kind of rotor root type, type of thing. Um, take care of the you know bad tissue and and try to smooth things out, but really that has uh, you know limited uh, effect on a lot of people. It might buy them six months, it might buy them a little bit more time, but the fact still remains: you got you know the cartilage wearing down from the joint, and you got bare bone rubbing on bare bone, and that's going to be a bad thing for the patient any which way you cut it. So now, again, because of the advances in arthroscopy and t the techniques, and now the, uh, the use of this graph that we have, 
what we actually do with these type of patients is that we do it arthroscopically and we take the graft and we put it as an interpositional graft between the ball and the socket. It's like a cushion. So we go in, we sew this graft onto the socket basically as a cushion between the ball and the socket. And so <clears throat> you're talking about these patients with arthritis. They're younger patients. We use these dermal allografts as we talked about before. And you're doing it as an arthroscopic technique. And whereas before, here you have a good cartilage, right? This is how it's supposed to look, white. And uh, that provides smooth gliding between the joint surfaces. And in the lower right, you see someone with arthritis. This is kind of what it looks, right? They got no cartilage. This is just bare bone and bare bone. And here's some of the cartilage that's kind of left around. But that's what causes pain, right? Bare bone rubbing on uh, bare bone. And so in these cases, what we do is we uh, use this graft. And you can see the, the pen marks that I put here um, to size out the graft. But then we actually suture that back onto the socket and it acts as an interpositional graft. And I'll tell you, the patients that we've done these for, um, the nice thing about these is because it's done arthroscopically and because it's done as just the graft in between the ball and the socket, there's really minimal downtime. I actually have them start moving right away. It's not like a rotator cuff repair where you have to you know, wait for that to heal for a good 12 weeks. These ones, you can start moving right away. And I got, there's got actually, Several people, firefighters particularly, is the one that I remember that get back to their jobs because of uh, this procedure, which is pretty amazing. And so uh, <clears throat> another, another uh, I think, a new technique this year that can be done in a very difficult to uh, treat population. So I'll talk a little bit about this specialist advantage. You know, I'm a shoulder specialist, right? This is what I do. You know, again, at the risk of selling myself. Um, it, whatever it is, if you had say, uh, tax needs, and I talk about this qu quite a bit, and you need to get your taxes done, <clears throat> and you have some issues with it, and you need a lawyer to kind of help you out, you're certainly not going to go find a divorce lawyer, right, or marriage lawyer to, to do that. I think in the same way, I think there's a significant advantage if you're looking for shoulder issues, go find the shoulder specialist. And that does, doesn't just apply to shoulders, but also ha uh, applies to knees, hips, or whatever it might be that, you, that you're looking for. And it's very clear uh, in the, um, <clears throat> the literature, you know, it's, these are amazing s statistics, and they remain largely true today, that 75% of shoulder replacements are performed by general orthopedic surgeons that do one or two a year, right? And that's just the reality of how it is in uh, America. And uh, the, the reason why that may be a problem is, you know, there's multiple studies looking at this kind of stuff. There's a direct correlation between how many somebody does of something and how well they do it. So the outcomes are significantly better for people who do more of it. And so I think for that reason, again, not just for your shoulder issues, um, for whatever it is, I think there's some advantage to seeking out specialists. And I think that's really the future as well of what we're doing. Um, and just like there's someone like me for shoulders, but there's also you know, all kinds of specialists that are sprouting out, especially in a metropolitan area like this, um, that I think uh, you'll, you know, many people, very savvy people in this area, high tech, high uh, education uh, people here will be seeking out. And uh, I just wanted to just kind of do a little plug on that. So in review, we talked a little bit about some uh, new techniques uh, in biologics. So in non-operative treatment like platelet-rich plasma, we talked about a couple of uh, arthroscopic techniques that are also new. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully that was entertaining. This, this is my, I, I've had the same picture for a long time and I finally had to get, get a new one. These are my four girls. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, questions? I have a question. Yeah. How long does the graph last when you move it between bone and socket? Yeah, that's a really good question. Do you know yet? Uh, yeah. Do you need to know? Yeah, so, you know, my hope is that they last a minimum of five years. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and that's probably, I think, on the conservative side. So I've had, uh, so some of these procedures have been going on for a little while. I've had a patient that actually initially got their surgery five years ago at the Cl Cleveland Clinic. They do it a little bit differently than I do. They actually replace the ball with uh, metal. But on the socket side, they put a graft. 
Um, but back then, they really didn't have these three millimeter graphs, nothing like that, and they did it open. They had more like one to one and a half millimeter graphs, and that lasted them five years. And then recently, he was 40 at the time, he was 45 when he saw me, and I re redid it with the thicker graph this time. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how long he lasts. That was, I think, maybe a year or two ago. Yeah. That's a quick question on, I know you were kind of a pioneer on this, so you can kind of touch on this, but the Da Vinci Robotics, yeah. are you using that kind of exclusively in certain surgeries, or are you using it kind of across the board now, or what kind of things are you, I know you were trained on that years ago, yeah. first coming out, so. Yeah, so Ben's Da Vinci Robot, have you guys heard of that? So, wow, that's, yeah, that's amazing. So Da Vinci robots are used in a lot of different disciplines outside of orthopedic surgery, gynecologic surgery, now actually even plastic surgery, general surgery, they're being uh, used in those type of things, Euro urologic surgery. But in orthopedic surgery, it really hasn't gone mainstream. I was actually studying this about five years ago, trying to do shoulder procedures using these Da Vinci robots. But um, their original robots were really designed for abdominal procedures. So they're very big arms and clunky. It's really hard to maneuver them. The nice thing about them is that you have actually fairly um, uh, mobile arms that you can use. And you're, it's like playing a video game, honestly, because uh, you can wake up at your house if you had a console and operate on someone you know, miles away. Um, but it just wasn't. The technology wasn't there, and when we we're talking to Intuitive Surgical, who's the owner of that technology, uh, the the cost of developing something for orthopedic surgery would have been, I think, cost prohib prohibitive based on kind of the requirements of having to be performed in an outpatient surgery center and things like that. Um, and I think nowadays, the, I think most of the feeling in the orthopedic side is that the arthroscopic techniques are so good that you know, may, many of them may or may not feel like it'd be beneficial. I still think that there's room for it, but I think it's ears away. We also just got a question from uh, Mandy, who's over in Seattle right now. <laughs> she said, what are the outcomes on range of motion of the superior capsular reconstruction versus a reverse total shoulder? Do you expect? Yeah, that's a great question. So for reverse total shoulders, if you look at the literature, the average that people get is a little bit overhead, like 100 degrees. Right? So if this is 90, they get a little bit above that. That's the average. Obviously, there's some patients that really get really great range of motions after reverses, but on average, it's that. With superior cancer, capsule reconstruction, that's also very, it's variable for the patient, but it won't be unusual to see significantly better range of motions because of what it does. And so um, I, I think on average, you're going to find that the superior capsule reconstructions are going to have better range of motion compared to reverses on average. Um, but again, it's a salvage procedure for a very di difficult issue. With regards to the PRP, is there a, a, a time that you will suggest that? Is that like after you've tried cortisone, or are there patients that you think are a better candidate for PRP versus cortisone? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. Um, that's one thing to keep in mind. If you have a cortisone injection before a PRP, the PRP won't be as effective because the effects of the uh, PRP is negated by cortisone. So if you're ever going to use it, I think it's a good idea to do it before you do any other type of treatment like that. Um, I, I basically offer it as an option for people that I think might uh, have an interest in it as an option. I, I offer both the cortisone and the PRP. But the people that I might push a little bit more towards PRP versus cortisone are really the young people. So people in their teens, 20s, really people I don't want to be messing with their cartilage by putting cortisone into. I really do try to push the PRP um, for that reason. And the other population group that I find that is very helpful that I've seen so far is really younger patients with arthritis as well. That seems to work fairly well in those patients. Yeah. The other uh, population group that we'll also use it in is, is patients after surgery um, with either uh, they've proven to not heal where, well before, so they had failed surgery in the past, or they have uh, large tears that have previously been shown to not heal as well. Those are patients that we might also bring that up as an option so that, that we can in, improve and optimize their chance of healing. 
throw, basically throw the kitchen sink at it, so to speak. Yeah. Will stem cells play a part in anything you do? Yeah, so that's the next frontier, you know, after PRP, right? So we have PRP. Stem cells really is kind of the evolution of that idea, and it's still early in its infancy. But we'll be hearing about that quite a bit in the coming uh, few months to years. Yeah. How would you see that playing in? It's hard to know because there's so many things that we don't know about it. Um, but uh, it's exciting to think about, though. I mean, if you think about injecting those type of cells in areas where it needs healing, where you know those cells can transform into bone cells or tenocytes or whatever it is, uh, that's pretty. It's pretty amazing to think. Um, but again, I think it's going to take some time. Yeah. Any other questions? One question actually from Korea. <laughs> Interesting. Do you think the non significant outcomes we're seeing with arthroscopic surgeries like meniscectomy would be different if they were done by specialists? So, what's the question again? Like basically, <coughs> meniscectomy to be like, I guess the topic here is that. It, if it's done by a general, whether they're doing ankle, knee, foot, back, a little bit of everything, the outcomes in even meniscectomy be better if it was just someone doing just primarily knee. You know, again, my personal opinion is absolutely, and I think the literature would support that as well. Again, anytime someone does more of it, they're just going to be faster at doing it. They're going to be better at looking at difficult issues, which you'll always face, even in simple things as partial meniscectomies. And so if those are true, I feel like, again, in a one patient, you might not see that difference. But as you start doing 100 cases, 1,000 cases, you're going to definitely see the results and the benefits of a specialist. Yeah. Great. I have one more question. I'm very lame way down the line because I don't know enough about sh shoulders. But yeah. is the goal of all these procedures to take away the pain and increase the range of motion? Or is it does the pain still exist afterwards? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I understand if it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, or yeah, a lot of everything. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the goal of any type of surgery that we do is to restore the anatomy, mm -hmm. right? So you want to restore kind of how things once were. So if it's torn, you repair it. Um, and so the idea there is to improve the function um, and the pain. And, and I think that's always a two-pronged goal for everybody that wants to treat patients. Obviously, pain is probably what brought them in, but function is also important to them. And so those are both things that we try to aim at improving. Um, you know, in certain cases, we may be more successful than others. Yeah, but both. Anything else? Great. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks guys for coming. Uh, we're going to have another lecture here. Um, Dr. Boone from Bellevue Bone and Joint is going to join us um, with our, his specialty, which is going to be June 22nd. So we'll keep you guys uh, updated as that gets closer to. Have a good night. Thanks for coming. Cool. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah.